quite a treat because um, our speaker, Mady Hornig, is one of those people with that 100-page resume I was telling you about. So it's hard to sum it all up in just a paragraph, but um, I will um, do that, but with respect. <laughs> um, Mady, she is the associate, associate Professor of Epidemiology and Director of Translational Research in the Jerome L. and Don Green Infectious Disease Laboratory at the Mailman School of Public Health in Columbia University. A physician scientist, she is widely recognized for her animal model and clinical research on the role of microbial, immune, and toxicological factors in neuropsychiatric disorders, including autism. Did you hear that? Microbial and autism, kind of what we're here doing here. Schizof and also her work in schizophrenia, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, and mood disorders. She leads a project on immune and neuroendocrine factors in West Nile virus encephalitis within the Northeast Biodefense Center and NIAID. How do you say that? What's the short NIAID. Okay, there's not like NIAID or something. Okay, NIAID, Regional Center of Excellence in Biodefense and Emerging Infectious Diseases, where she is a core member of the Core Oversight Committee and the Governing Council. She was recently elected to the President's Council of Cornell Women, and I didn't write this down, but um, maybe you can tell them your recent joining of the Scientific Advisory Board for the Columbia, the blind people. Okay, so let's give her a hand. The blind people. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Tammy. And uh, I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, yeah, we have a new center at Columbia University uh, led by Dr. Brian Fallon uh, for Lyme disease research and, uh, and other tick-borne diseases. And he's a psychiatrist and very interested in neuropsychiatric effects uh, if in all age ranges. So I am going to give you a whirlwind um, talk and the um, while there are many details there what I'm trying to really convey to you today is a broad approach to understanding or trying to learn what we need to learn about connections between pathogens or microbial agents infections um, that uh, that may or may not be pathogenic, that may just be uh, sort of, you know, common agents that may not cause disease but may contribute in, under certain circumstances to disease, how toxic agents in the environment may interact and also cause their own disturbances in developing organisms, and to try to give you a feel for how we approach these questions as scientists uh, in trying to explore what the connections are. So I've titled my talk, Immunity and Redox Redux, and I will describe for you what redox means in very brief, uh, in very brief terms. Immunity, of course, is the host response to infectious agents or to all sorts of environmental factors. And we are learning that these are very interactive uh, systems that may have broad implications for the development of not only autism but other neurodevelopmental disorders. We have the obligation to make certain that our facts are correct how we put them together in terms of a causal mechanism uh, and the hypotheses or th theories that we build need not be, be uh, c correct. We can take some risk there trying to put facts together, but we really need to be certain as to what our facts are in order to try to do the best uh, for uh, discovery of real solutions um, for disorders like autism and other serious neurodevelopmental conditions. Um, of course, Mark Twain had a different uh, take on this than, than Hans Selye. Something fascinating by science, one gets such wholesale returns of conjecture out of such a trifling investment of fact. So we do have to be wary about what the nature of our facts are and what the circumstances are in the laboratory or who we're taking our data from. Um, and 
case series are important, but we need to know how to combine those with controlled investigations that can shed the most light for us all. Our approach is really what we call the three strikes you're out approach. We look at three strikes, genes, environment, and timing. And we try to understand pathogenesis, which basically means mechanisms by which something that is an abnormality occurs. And in this fast forward, in my sort of known as my da Vinci slide, um, of the fast forward of development, we see that genetic factors are important in figuring out what are the steps of development. Um, but they also define the missteps of development. They also define, to some degree, how quickly the steps unfold. There's not a huge amount of variation in that. Generally, we have a 40-week gestation in humans. But there is some in terms of the uh, actual you know, day-to-day -day or hour-to-hour -hour changes that may occur. Um, and those are important because in autoimmune systems, autoimmune strains of mice, for instance, their brains and their immune systems seem to develop on a different timetable than non-immune, autoimmune disease susceptible animals. So we might learn about, uh, about those sorts of things. And that's both prenatal as well as postnatal. <clears throat> Environmental factors that we consider are really a very broad category. Microbial agents, such as Borrelia, um, viral infections, um, streptococcal infections, um, toxicants in the environment also can be as uh, in and of themselves, but also in interaction. Malnutrition, oxidative stress, psychosocial stressors can even have an impact on the uh, homeostatic balance of, of, a, of an organism, and of course prior experience, both psychosocial as well as exposures, whether they're infectious or toxicologic. And these interact through prenatal and postnatal development to yield a variety of outcomes, some of which may be evident in early childhood, like attention deficit disorder and autism. In middle age uh, or early adult psychiatric and demyelinating disorders like multiple sclerosis. And also in late adulthood, degenerative disorders like Parkinson and Alzheimer. And even for Alzheimer disease, we are thinking that there may be the roots of that disorder, which presents in old age, the roots of that disorder may be laid down prenatally or in early postnatal life and that there may be additional insults that you need throughout your life, but some key events may ha happen very early on. When we think about how different infectious agents may cause a wide range of diseases, we have some easy types of scenarios and we have some more complex scenarios. The easy ones are when you have acute disease. You have a direct effect at, at the site where the infectious agent comes in, the organism replicates itself and it causes damage. Polio virus, for instance, it comes in and it kills the motor neurons and you have paralysis. In other scenarios, you may have a change in the physiologic balance. The toxic agent may alter the ion transport, for instance, in the intestine, like in cholera, and that would give you diarrhea. Um, so then we start to get more and more complex. Sometimes an infectious agent will come in and it, is, it, it enters by a tick bite, perhaps. It enters by a, an oral uh, pharyngeal root. You have a strep throat. Um, or it is a, you know, some other sort of inf infectious uh, entrance into the system. But the effects may be distal to the site where the infection occurs. And there you can have uh, agents like botulism, right? So um, that, that toxin will interfere with the neurotransmitter function at the nerve muscle junction. It's not exactly where it's coming, where it's coming in. Uh, it, and it replicates and it circulates. There are also host responses to the agent that may lead to the problem. In hepatitis, for instance, the infected liver cells um, are killed by an immune response, not a direct effect of the virus. Microbes may, can suppress the immune system, and they may alter your susceptibility to other agents. So for measles infection, for instance, 
um, there can be a, an exacerbation of uh, tuberculosis or other opportunistic infections, and the same for HIV. The mechanism by which an infectious agent can lead to disease also depends on what is the maturational status of the host at the time of infection. And some of these agents can be teratogenic. And we know certainly with rubella, it's the most classic one that we know of congenital rubella syndrome, first trimester congenital infection results in a spectrum of, of defects. Um, some cases it led to autism-like uh, features, but not in 100%. And we don't know the reason for that. There are maybe other genetic factors that contribute. There are even more complicated types of scenarios where the acute infection may not even be really, really clear. And this is what's called um, interference with differentiated or what we call luxury cell function. So the cell doesn't die, but its function is, uh, is, uh, you know, is made abnormal in some way. And Typically, it'll um, do this, again, without killing the cell. And so it may alter the neurotransmitters like norepinephrine or serotonin, which are important for your brain function, or it could alter your hormone status. It could alter the amount of stress hormones that you put out under different circumstances. And these can be direct effects of viral infections, such as with lymphocytic choriomeningitis virus. There are also scenarios where the immune response induces something that's called molecular mimicry. That means that the agent leads to an immune response that kind of gets sloppy, gets cross-reactive with other types of body parts, an autoimmune reaction, autoantibody reaction. And streptococcus um, is a scenario which we'll talk about. Uh, I'll describe some of our animal model work there. In that case, Antibodies will um, develop to the bacterium, to the strep, uh, but they also bind to host proteins. And these can be cardiac or brain, so central nervous system. And this can lead to things like St. Vitus dance, which was um, it's called also known as Sydenham Korea. Some people think that the witch hunts um, were, you know, uh, that these witches who were burnt at the stake may have been subject to some of these types of uh, reactions. And uh, we also know a, a syndrome called PANDAS, uh, which has an obsessive compulsive disorder component. And we'll talk a little bit about our mouse model of that and what that might mean for humans. We also know that there can be, as I said, with Alzheimer's and other, uh, and Parkinson's disease, some of the roots, uh, some of the uh, exposures could be very early in life, and the effects could be very long term. And this becomes a challenge for determining what's going on, because unless you're following up a, a cohort of individuals over a huge lifespan, if it's a hit and run, if the agent comes in, does its damage, let's say it sets up an autoimmune reaction, and, but then the agent is gone. How do you know what caused the autoimmune reaction to begin with? What features can we look at in the individual who has the disorder to try to track back what, is, what, are the what are the footprints there. So we need to really think about what are the molecular footprints, the biochemical footprints, or even the clinical footprints that can tell us what might have been there. Or are there certain types of studies that we can do very long term, and I'll tell you a little bit about our work to do those sorts of long term prospective studies with the right types of samples so we can understand what's going on. In multiple sclerosis, for instance, individuals who are born at a northern latitude um, are much more likely to be susceptible to, um, to multiple sclerosis, but it's only where they lived before they reached puberty. So we know, again, there's some critical periods and timing, and so we need to try to under understand that. We need to know what questions to ask. If we don't understand what's important here and how the mechanisms might work. We don't even know what questions to ask or what types of samples we require to answer these really critical questions about what caused these very serious neuropsychiatric disturbances. And for schizophrenia, um, maternal exposure to rubella and influenza is uh, uh, increased, um, leads to an increased ris risk for schizophrenia, but only in late second trimester. 
early second trimester influenza exposure seems to be associated with psychotic depression. So the brain development at the precise time that this is happening, um, probably the maternal host factors as well as the fetal host factors during, uh, you know, because in this case this is prenatal exposure. And again, we have uh, some reason to believe that this may not be specific to a particular infectious agent. Bacteria, viruses, a wide range of infectious agents may lead to an increased risk for certain types of neuropsychiatric disorders. And we have some animal models there also to try to understand that. Autism, of course, is a disorder that was first described, you, I, you could probably tell, tell me as, as well from all of your, your reading. Um, Kanner and Asperger uh, first described the disorder in 1943 and 1944. We don't know whether autism existed as we know it today prior to their descriptions. Kanner was an astute, uh, an, a very astute clinician in a day when uh, clinical exam and memory for all of the uh, various you know, minutiae of the clinical exam and the history were so important uh, to, to clinical medicine. And he was clear, his quote was, this is something I have never seen before. I have never seen this before. And Asperger also similarly um, described this as a condition that was unique uh, in their minds and uh, they, they found very, very similar patterns. If autism existed before this period of time, um, we don't know whether it's really the same in terms of its clinical features. Was it a different subset? Uh, were, there just, uh, were there some genetic uh, disorders that had autistic features? Are those the same? Is it autism or should it be autisms? And we really have a lot to learn there. Of course, there has been a lot of interest in whether there really is an autism epidemic. Um, and much controversy over this, uh, over this issue. Clearly, the reported prevalence since 1985 or thereabouts is about tenfold higher. We do not know to what degree diagnostic awareness and, uh, and, and broader or cha changing uh, application of diagnostic definitions may have incre increased the rate. Clearly, that has contributed to some degree. We do not have data, in my mind, that resolve either way as to whether there is a real increase or not. Um, and I, we may not actually be able to do those studies. Um, and if the rate has increased, I mean, the, the, the importance there is that environmental factors must be at play if it has been a fast uh, rate of rise. And so it is important, but it may not be a tractable question for us to actually answer using epidemiologic study designs. And I think that there's increasing acceptance that pursuit of both genetic and environmental factors in autism and their interactions are, is probably really key. The male-female ratio is four to one. What does that tell us what, about what the bi neurobiology might be? Are there sex steroid effects that, that could contribute? Are these prenatal? Are these postnatal? DHEA, testosterone, et cetera. Asperger uh, may have a higher male-to-female ratio, up to 13 to one, versus autism uh, with mental retardation, which is more commonly uh, seen in, in girls. We know that there's some kids with regression and they have GI disturbances. What does that mean about the pathogenesis and the causes? Some kids have large heads, but only at one period of time, and it, it increases around 18 to 24 months of age and then levels off. What's going on with that? Um, is there a prenatal cause there, or is it something that is happening later? We don't know. Autopsy data suggests that there's a developmental lesion, but we also know that there are very few brains out there. Um, there is very low mortality with autism, and uh, we need to understand what the, uh, what the differences are and to do more work on this, uh, of, of, of this sort um, o over time. Neurochemical disturbances have been described, dopamine, serotonin, glutamate, and also seasonal viral and immune links, um, but not 
consistent. We also know that genetic and epigenetic contributions are likely to be really key. CNV uh, is, stands for copy number variation, and it turns out that there is a high rate of copy number variation in the genes, an abnormality that's seen more commonly in families that only have one individual with autism as opposed to families that have multiple individuals with autism. Um, why is that? Um, is it that the multiple, uh, the, fa the multiplex families have more genetic contribution than those that have only a single individual with autism? And that in the case of the um, simplex families, that perhaps those may be a really rich population to look for environmental factors. Um, not that it doesn't mean, not that it means that these children have no genetic uh, contributors to their disorder but that environmental factors may inter interact with genetic contributors. We know that they, what we, we look at twin studies often to try to determine how much of a disorder is genetic, how much is, you know, how much is related to uh, environment. And monozygotic or identical twins are reported up to 60 to 90 percent broadly, if you're looking at the broad autism phenotype, um, have, if one twin has it, the other identical twin will have autism. But it may not look exactly the same, even in those identical twins. Dizygotic twins, who are sharing only the same amount of genetic material that siblings would share, should have the same as the sibling rate if there is no environmental factor occurring prenatally or perhaps even early postnatally. Um, early studies had four twin dizygotic twin pairs or fraternal twin pairs. Later studies that have included, you know, more reasonable numbers so that we had the power to understand uh, from a statistical standpoint to understand something more have reported up to 36 percent. Um, and that is really very interesting because the sibling rate is reported at 4 to 10 percent. So if fraternal twins have this increased rate, there could be a prenatal or a postnatal infectious agent that could be at play. Rett syndrome also is um, a disorder that has autistic features. Her, it occurs only in girls, but it also is f mutations of the Rett uh, uh, gene um, have been found in autism, and there are also modifications that can occur to the RET protein um, after, you know, after the initial process. So you can have uh, the, the process of um, the RNA uh, being altered and also the protein being, uh, being altered. And so that could mean that there are outside agents, infections, toxicants that can come in and alter that, that protein. And it may be that there are certain RET mutations that may not uh, be classic, but that could be structured so that infectious agents or products of infectious agents or toxicants may interact with those proteins. And this is a model that many of us are uh, trying to, uh, to build now to understand the possibility of um, genetic factors, you know, not being necessarily only the classic uh, mutations, but perhaps other more complicated types of um, alterations in the genetic uh, makeup. Again, the, the uh, prevalence has been reported to be uh, increased up to 67 uh, per 10,000 for, uh, for the broad category and 40 uh, per 10,000 after 1985. Why 1985? Well, I'll get to that hypothesis in a moment. Um, again, we talked about diagnostic substitution and the fact that there are a variety of infectious and toxic agents to, to consider. Um, and also that these toxicants and also infectious agents um, may alter the processes, the epigenetics, that may alter the methylation and the histones in the, in the, that uh, are involved in DNA expression. 1985 comes in, in my mind, because there is a change, uh, as many pediatricians will remember. In 1985, we had the beginning of the concerns about something called Ray syndrome. If you look on your aspirin bottles, it says, don't give to your kids if they're 16 years, you know, if they're under 16 years of age. Um, and so Ray syndrome concerns wholesale changed the pediatric 
uh, armamentarium in 1985. So we no longer used aspirin. St. Joseph's baby, baby aspirin became a cardiac drug. Um, and we, you know, for older, for older individuals. Um, and it wasn't until about 1995 that we introduced um, ibuprofen and, and those, sorts of, those sorts of other anti-inflammatory agents. The acetaminophen usage that began in 1985 um, could potentially be associated with some risk for about 20 percent of the population. About 20 percent of the population has oxidative stress, would have a abnormal redox reactions to acetaminophen. And this could alter the response to infectious agents as well as alter a, a number of other uh, types of scenarios. Um, it has no anti-inflammatory component also. So if you're giving something to, uh, to alter uh, the, the pathway, this could have an effect. And there are other interesting hypotheses uh, that uh, Dr. Torres, for instance, has, ha has had in terms of thinking of that um, change in fever uh, management in children as a potential contributor to development of, of autism. Autism or autisms, what is it? These are the psychiatric features. This is the column, two from column A, one from column B. I won't bore you with those, you know, with those details. We know most of you, um, many of you who may be parents or clinicians treating children uh, know uh, what these are very well. Um, this is sort of, is a, is a, you'll see in a moment, it's called my sort of wheel of misfortune, if you will. Um, and goes around and shows um, really that there are many features of autism that may tell us something about systemic disease. If you have an infection, if it's not an abscess that's only in your skin and isolated, you are likely to have a systemic effect. So we need to understand how the features that we see in autism could potentially fit in to that type of systemic model. What might we see in autism that could fit with that? Well, in gold are the three classic DSM-4 uh, features of, of autism. But we know that even in the psychiatric realm we have other features. We have obsessive compulsive attention, mood, and disinhibition as, as, as other features which don't aren't required to make the diagnosis, but that often occur, and give us some diversity to the subsets of, of autism. Cognitive disturbances, mental retardation, has been decreasing in its prevalence in, uh, as a comorbid disorder with autism. And as I mentioned earlier, mental retardation and autism together is more likely to have a reduced male to female ratio. In other words, more females are represented in that population and fewer males. What does that mean about what, ca what the causes are? Some kids have savant skills, some kids don't. Some kids have prodigious learning and memory processes for facts, uh, some, some don't. Some are able of, uh, to do some abstract thought, some cannot. There are visual sim symptoms that include not only ocular motor movements and the joint attention, whether you're looking at, at some, somebody, um, peripheral vision may be affected. And there are three electroretinogram studies now that have shown that there are disturbances in the electrical activity that goes across the retina. What's, what's going on with that? Could that be something that involves infection? Certainly there are many agents that will affect the eye. Sensory systems can be affected, uh, motor systems, some kids are coordinated, some kids are not. There can be seizures, often they appear in uh, just pre-adolescence or adolescence, but not certainly not in all. There are growth disturbances, head size, um, also body size. There are immune disturbances, autoimmune and infection, and the GI disturbances that can occur again in a subset, more commonly in kids with regression uh, in, some, in some studies, but not in association in terms of the onset with the uh, administration of MMR vaccine, for instance. Um, that doesn't mean that there, you know, is no change or reaction to vaccines that, 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 that can occur, but if you look carefully at the clinical course, kids who start out with a relatively normal course and undergo regression, which could be loss of language or other skills, tend to have more of the gastrointestinal disturbances. Sometimes they're found to have inflammatory bowel disease in addition. What does this mean to, to the potential causes of autism or autisms? 
there can be lax ligaments. What could be more systemic than, you know, than that? What is that? What's going on there? Connective tissue um, and bone uh, as well. So this is certainly not all in the head, in the brain, or and not only restricted to the nervous system. So again, the genetic studies suggest that there's a large contribution from genetics, but certainly it's not all. This is one of the most highly heritable neuropsychiatric conditions that exists. However, if you look at the concordance um, for, for monozygotic twins, it's less than 100 percent. And again, they, one kid may have something that looks like Asperger's and another may have uh, something that looks like autism with mental retardation. So it is not purely genetics that's going to tell us there. We also know that no single gene has popped out as being the, the key. Um, and there are, it's likely that there are epigenetic influences. There's a MET polymorphism, which has uh, been recently reported with an increased risk of um, autism spectrum disorders. And that gene actually can affect CNS development, gastrointestinal, and immune function. The link to immune response genes, as you heard, I, I gather this morning, the, the change in the schedule, uh, that there, there are um, relationships to immune response genes. And interestingly, those studies have happened as with the, you know, the, uh, the finding with the copy number variation being more common in simplex families, ki families that are affected only by one uh, child with autism, and, and it's less likely to occur in multiplex families, suggesting that immune response genes, which are there to help us respond to the environment, right, with infect to infectious agents, that those, are, that those are key factors. Geographic differences also are um, found in that HLA association in one study where they found that it was most uh, commonly seen in a certain cluster, suggesting that so that the HLA association was, was, uh, was very significant, but even more so in a cluster that uh, was in Tennessee, and they had suggested that there might be an environmental factor that could have contributed and interacted with that immune response chain. And I think these are really key uh, types of things to, to think about. HLA associations can mean a lot of other things, too. It could mean that you have auto, a predisposition to autoimmune disease. Um, and C4B null allele is something that's seen in classical autoimmune disease, uh, as well as reduction in the C4B protein. Of increased rate of family history of autoimmune and allergic disorders are, uh, are reported in, in autism. And we know that there are some geographic clusters that have been looked at. There's a school in New Jersey. New Jersey apparently is number one on the CDC list. There's a school in New Jersey where nine out of nine women who gave birth to boys in one classroom have had children with either autism or other learning disor dis disturbances in a, in a seven-year period. Um, interest or 10-year period, I guess, in 97 to 2007. So we don't know what that's, it, those sorts of things are about. We do know that mercury exposure can uh, environmentally is associated with increased rate of autism, but that's at the ecologic level. That's not taking blood levels from children or from mothers and seeing who was actually exposed. It's done sort of tying something that's reported in one geographic area and autism that's reported in that area as well. The seasonal uh, evidence has been quite inconsistent. No one has done it in association with immune response genes, unfortunately. Uh, viral associations, again, have been many, and, uh, and also other uh, infectious agents. And toxins and immune disturbances are also uh, d reported. Immune disturbances include a shift to so-called Th2 cytokines, which are, uh, you know, can be globally thought of as autoimmune sensitive types of cytokines. Um, but in, uh, we also see an increase in interferon gamma and IL-12. And certain antibodies are, are also altered with a reduction in C4B, complement C4B, which is also reported in classical autoimmune diseases. And in studies now that involve CSF, spinal fluid as well as uh, autopsy material uh, by the Vargas group, they found that certain chemokines are evidence of inflammation in the brains of individuals with autism, MCP1 and TGF-beta1. So this suggests that there could be a phenotype, a subset, perhaps an endophenotype, which is a, perhaps a genetically tractable group that has uh, interactions of the nervous and the immune systems, and that could perhaps 
be associated with certain types of environmental factors, not necessarily only one. Um, I'm going to just move on here to what my favorite example of how a gene environment interaction works. Um, this is adolescent onset cannabis use and its effect on adult psychosis. So here's you have a genetic polymorphism, the COMT gene, and I'll uh, show you in the next slide that there's um, an effect here. This effect is not significant if you're looking at the genotype alone. Early cannabis use is also by itself not a problem. But if you have the, gen the, po the genetic problem as well as the early cannabis use, you um, have a highly significant effect. Again, we can all rest easy. Adult cannabis use didn't have the same effect. Um, but um, we, this is really tells you something about how you can miss effects. If you're only looking at, you could substitute here infectious agent X, right? If you needed, and you could substitute any immune response gene, for instance, if you needed the immune response gene and the infectious agent exposure during a particular period of life, so it's really gene, environment, and timing, if you were looking only at the gene and if you were looking only at the infectious exposure, you would miss it. So we need to design studies carefully in order to understand what's going on and to, and to really sort of go back and forth as we do through the epidemiologic and the animal models. In our version of epidemiology, we use this as a tool, much as the individual who's trying to diagnose an infection will use a diagnostic assay or molecular tools or somebody who's looking at the genes is going to look at the DNA. In epidemiology, we use certain classical structured approaches to try to be sure about causation um, or what the implications are for causation. We can never really prove, we can only support causation. So I'm going to take you through a whirlwind of some of our animal models that are just trying to get some clues uh, that we can then bring into epidemiologic studies and try to use those clues to make a story or to, to really do the right type of investigation to see whether there is a role for infection um, or support for that hypothesis. Some of our early work um, was um, on rats and they were using, we were using a virus called Borna disease virus. We were interested because there had been all sorts of neuropsychiatric syndromes actually reported to be potentially associated with this virus, ranging from schizophrenia to autism. We've looked in autism. We haven't found evidence in humans of this virus. So why are we using it? Well, we're using it for a very good reason, and that is because it allows us to understand the differences in how a single agent introduced at different times during maturation of the central nervous system and the immune systems may lead to different outcomes. And so, and it works very well for that purpose, and then we can start to understand some of the mechanisms that are important. And basically, if you give this to an adult animal, you have something that looks a lot like a Parkinson's disease. But more to the point, you see an acute infection and acute inflammation, and that means immune cells that go to the brain. If you were to do an MRI, you would see evidence of inflammation on that MRI. Do we see this in autism? No. Do we see this in most neuropsychiatric syndromes? No. It would be easy to link infection to neuropsychiatric disorders if it was acute infection with an encephalitis. That would be a very different scenario. We are looking for some, something that is much more subtle, and we have to do a different type of detective work. In our neonatal model, we have features by, you know, uh, behaviorally that look a lot like autism, play disturbances, taste preferences, learning deficits, some hyperactivity. Um, and the pathways in the rat are similar to those that are reported to, you know, that, that, that are involved in these behaviors, are similar to the ones that are reported to be disturbed in human autism. And here we don't see an encephalitis, so that's sort of consistent with what we, you know, find in, you know, in, in human autism, right? We see inflammation, chronic inflammation, you know, in terms of various uh, uh, soluble substances that are there and microglial cells, uh, but we don't expect to see a huge amount of, you know, pus in the brain. That's basically what, you know, what you would be looking for with, uh, you know, with, with encephalitis or in infl inflammatory cells. 
Um, we do see hippocampus and cerebellar disturbances. And, and the uh, neurotransmitters that are involved, serotonin and glutamate, are reported in autism. And in the adult scenario, we see something that looks like an obsessive compulsive disorder. I used to describe this slide as how I fe felt when I came as a, um, a clinical psychiatrist to, uh, to work in the laboratory and be carrying the Petri dish back and forth all day. Um, but this is different um, and that's, you know, that it could be considered to be uh, consistent with some aspects of, of autism, but it, it really obsessive compulsive features are happening in many different types of disorders and we have to remember that, that a single feature is not going to be pathognomonic meaning it's not going to be a single specific identifying feature. Um, here we see that there are uh, changes in the dopamine system that, that are affected. This is a decrease here in the, in the brain region that's involved with motor movements. And these animals, if you use this, if you block the overactive receptor, which is the D1, um, in these animals that are tail biting, they will be, uh, you know, abrogate the tail biting during the period that the drug is active, and then once the drug is cleared, it's gone. So we focused, however, that because we were feeling that encephalitis is so, uh, you know, uh, non, uh, such a non-issue in terms of what we're, we're classically seeing, at least at the time we're looking at individuals with autism, we wanted to focus on the neonatal model because clearly something is happening and there are disturbances that are happening here, uh, but it's happening through without seeing classical immune cells coming in. Um, we found here also that there were appealing aspects of the model that were interesting uh, with respect to autism. Um, there are reflexes. Kids normally corkscrew through the midline and they turn over and that involves the white matter tracts developing and coordinating from the right and left hemispheres of the brain and across. And kids with autism instead tend to ventriflex and rock. They don't corkscrew through the midline. And uh, there happens to be a convenient reflex in rodents either from a surface or uh, from dropping them from a height or uh, in a surface. And we found that if we did this on a surface, we found that these animals would actually fall onto their back and un be unable to get back on, on all fours compared to the control animal that um, would never, never show this uh, disturbance. Um, we also know that there were effects with respect to the, uh, the ultrasonics. So, i um, not sure if you can hear that, but there's uh, basically, there's some little chirpy sounds there. That's a control animal. And uh, if you go to the infected animal, hopefully I can get, the, uh, get it going here. It's a much higher, it's a higher pitch sound and there's actually each of these lumps, e each of these uh, spikes is, uh, is a more distinct sort of sound. So they have hundreds of calls compared to the animals that are, um, that are not uh, it infected. And so they have a disturbed social communication. You have to get that out there with a bat detector to, to hear them. Um, they lose cells in, in a pattern that has uh, been reported uh, in, uh, in autism, and in particular, Purkinje cells, these cells that are important in the cerebellum for helping with motor control um, and motor movements and initiation of motor movements, these are, these are cells that are lost. That happens in autism as well. We also know that there are some features um, when you look at the substructure, the ultrastructure of the cells, these are granule cells in a learning and memory center. These become spindly. Um, down here, the infected cells are, are, are spindly and they have little bumps called varicosities. Um, unfortunately, no one has looked at these specific cells, uh, but in a, another region of the learning and memory center or hippocampus, it's been reported that you do have the spindly effect and again, the varicosities that occur in autism. Um, again, that doesn't prove that this was viral infection that caused it in autism, but that the features were certainly similar to some type of stressor um, that altered the brain development. Glutamate receptors are also affected. Again, this is the infectious agent specifically targeting a chemical system in the brain. And it's not only, it, this is a subset of, of the glutamate chemical system. 
that's been reported to be abnormal in autism. Again, we see this only in the cells, um, in these GLUR1 cells. These are the learning memory centers again. And we think that this is a direct effect of the virus in altering the expression of these glutamate-related proteins and causing a greater sensitivity. Other infectious agents could do this as well. They create all sorts of products that can affect if they are in the brain. Um, there are changes in the cytokines that occur both at the level of the messenger RNA, the gene expression, as well as at the protein level. And in association with oxidative stress, one, this is the first report, this is uh, uh, Brent Williams from our laboratory working, working with us on metallothionine. It's a heavy metal binding protein. It's associated with oxidative stress. Viral infections have been shown in the peripheral system, in the peripheral blood, to show a change in metallothionine. But this is a virus causing a change in a heavy metal binding protein. What is this about? Right? So this is, again, an interaction between an, a, a, an infectious agent and the oxidative stress system. And you see an increase here in, uh, in that system. We also know that there are interactions amongst all of the uh, the different chemical pathways. The kynurenin pathway is triggered by an, an, uh, a cytokine or a, a groups of cytokines. So if you have immune stimulation, you are getting this uh, process going. And kynurenin, which is uh, the end product of this uh, pa kynurenin pathways, is neurotoxic substance called quinolinic acid. And we see an increase in multiple regions um, throughout, uh, throughout the brain uh, in this infection. And what's interesting here is that this starts out with the building block of serotonin, right? Serotonin, we've heard a lot about. There are actually autoantibodies that have been reported to serotonin receptors in, in, in autism. This takes seroto the serotonin's building block, or tryptophan, away from serotonin synthesis, and it degrades it. And you have you go down the ends of this pathway, and you find your quinolinic acid. And so it's a very complex pathway, but it's an interaction between the serotonin system, the immune system, and the actually also the steroid system, because glucocorticoids can trigger trigger it as well, and the glutamate system, because that's what your NMDA receptors are. Also, nicotine system can be affected. So we think that this is really an important type of pathway to be thinking about in all sorts of bacterial. Uh, and other infections. The glutamate system may be really relevant um, in, in, in all sorts of ways. I mean, it's been found by a, 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 a variety of groups in autism to be disturbed. AMPA receptor, that's one of the glutamate receptors. If you block, um, if you block that receptor, um, you can actually affect the um, the, the uh, behavior of these animals, and so by using these drugs. So this, in the blue bar here, you see this animal that's really quite uh, hyperactive. That's just received salt water treatment, and then as you give additional drug, you reduce it back to the control levels. So these animals are less hyperactive, and these may these drugs may form some promising ways to alter neural immune disorders. As I mentioned earlier. There's nothing that's very specific about Bornavirus, probably, um, in, this, in this scenario, um, in the animal model, but also in terms of what we know clinically about autism and other neuropsychiatric disorders, it may not just be a single virus, and it may not be just a single bacterium. There may be host responses that occur with a wide range of these agents that may be important. So we sought to try to look at it in a, in a, a sort of in a, in a broad sort of in a broad sort of way. And so we built a generic model, and we focused first on viral infection um, in a generic way, and we used a synthetic drug called PolyIC, and that actually is double-stranded RNA, and it basically, it's not an infection, but it mimics an infection in, and the immune response that's created by an infection. And we basically took animals at various uh, time points and looked at their behavior and their brains. And we know that if you use something, this has now been done with PolyIC as well, if you look for a short period of time, there's some differences in the way these studies uh, work, but um, the uh, Paul Patterson's group had found that if you give influenza to the mother, which is sort of like using this PolyIC um, during, during pregnancy, but early during pregnancy, you get animals that are sort of hanging out in the corner 
um, doing what's called thigmotaxis, uh, wall-hugging behavior. It's like an agoraphobia. That's the, the sort of, whereas the normal animal, when they first come in, the first 10 minutes will sort of walk around say, and, you know, and then eventually settle down and go to sleep. Um, but the animals that are exposed to poly-IC, if you look at them um, over a longer period of time, see, we expose our animals not in mid-gestation, but in late gestation, gestational day 16. It's just right before birth. These animals are wildly hyperactive. You can see these track plots here compared to the PBS animals that, again, the saline treated, they just go to sleep. You know, they, they explore a little bit and then they go to sleep. These animals are just hyperactive. And it looks a lot like an attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. They were quite impulsive. If you look at a wide range of cytokines and chemokines, you see differences in different strains of mice. This is basically just to show you that there is a huge range of uh, factors that may alter it as the immune profile, the host response varies according to the strain, the genetic makeup of the, of the mouse. Um, and if you look early on, we also see that the only animals that are affected early are these C57 animals. The SJ animals don't have any problem. This is day eight after uh, being exposed in, during uh, gestation, in late gestation. And you see here, they're, they're slower and they, they can't, they're not very coordinated. That's often seen in a wide range of neuropsychiatric conditions. It, we used to call it minimal brain dysfunction. Kids often don't meet their motor, you know, landmarks in the same, uh, to the, in the same way. Um, and so we think that that could be a, a valuable uh, clue. Uh, if you look at later time, time points, though, these animals, both, both strains of mice, have hyperactivity. So, again, looking at the course over time is going to tell us something about the gene-environment interaction, and that you can have these effects not only with a specific virus or, in, or bacterial infection, but even from something that is just mimicking the host response to those agents. So we next looked at um, another bacterium um, called the strep. Everybody knows about strep throat. This is PANDAS, Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Disorders after associated with streptococcal infection, long mouthful. Um, and it's possible also people are thinking that there may be other things besides strep that can induce this, but it's basically an autoimmune disease. We talked earlier when we were talking about the various ways in which infectious agents may affect brain development or alter the the, the organism um, about those pathways. And here it's a certain type of strep, group A beta, beta hemolytic strep. And uh, Sue Suido uh, had identified obsessive uh, compulsive symptoms, anxiety, and tics. And also later it's been found that there uh, is a substantial uh, number of kids with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder as well as learning disabilities. Okay. We've got, um, and there, there was a uh, there's a marker that we used to be able to use called the DA17 marker, which is on um, you know, cells, certain types of cells. And 78% of autism kids, even in the absence of strep infection, had uh, evidence of these uh, B lymphocytes. B lymphocytes are your antibody producing cells. And what was most uh, really uh, convincing, I think, was th that there was something autoimmune going on, was that immunomodulatory treatments like plasmapheresis, IVIG, and, an and, uh, and also antibiotics to prevent future strep were also affected. That effective. Now, antibiotics are a tricky one, um, and this is uh, as true for any, uh, any use of antibiotics. Antibiotics do clearly have antibiotic, antimicrobial effects, but they also have neurotransmitter effects in some cases. So some, uh, some of these actually affect the glutamate system. So if there's improvement with antibiotics, it doesn't prove that it was infection because there can be nonspecific effects of antibiotics. So we need to remain cognizant of those sorts of factors. These animals in the blue here, you see that they um, are uh, they're less coordinated. They fall off. The, they, uh, they're not able to stay on a rotating rod, so they have motor coordination difficulties. And they also have difficulties in terms of, uh, you know, compulsive behaviors. They get, uh, they do these backflips over and over again. They have antibodies in their peripheral blood that are directed against brain components, and, they, and also they have immune deposits in their brain. Their, um, their brains appear to be bigger, we're confirming that now, um, and that's been reported in kids with pandas. Um, so, and it's specific because it's only the motor uh, systems areas, because the thalamus, which is a sensory 
filtering system in the brain is not uh, affected. But these, you know, these kids are all larger uh, volume. And we think that it's a white matter effect, similar to what's report reported in autism. We think there may be some overlap here. We've actually done some fancy molecular uh, studies, uh, along with uh, Kavitha Yadnapudi, a very talented postdoc in our laboratory, and found that heat shock protein 70, constitutive heat shock protein, complements C4, remember you heard about that before with classical autoimmune disease, alpha-2 macroglobulin, these are the targets of the an autoantibody response. And so we're trying to use that to understand what's, what's, uh, what's going on. We've used human samples from Susuito's collection and found that there is uh, reactivity um, in the panda syrup, but not in normal kids. Um, with uh, this heat shock protein. And so we uh, are very uh, encouraged that there may be something going on there. And we would like to extend this in autism to look at these, uh, this type of bacterial infection induced. Again, these, these animals are immunized, so they don't have an active infection. They're just having a host response to the, to the, uh, to the agent. Um, and so that maybe this can form a model to explore in Lyme and, and in other infectious scenarios. Uh, this has heat shock proteins are important in redox and oxidative stress, and so we need to you know, try to piece together those, those aspects. Um, we do know also that there are toxic agents that can alter the immune function, postnatal thimerosal, mercury that is in, present in vaccines, but probably also susceptibility to other types of mercury in, in the environment is probably likely to uh, occur along with those individuals who are susceptible to thimerosal. Uh, up to 30% uh, of kids um, uh, with um, uh, have skin reaction, I'm sorry, 18% of kids would have a skin reaction to uh, thimerosal, hypersensitivity to thimerosal, and we know that it's been taken off out of contact lens solutions and off, you know, out of the, uh, the market. Um, there are a variety of genes that, that may be uh, altered there that could lead to this risk, and we know that there are immune and also oxidative stress reactions that it can occur with this form of mercury. And we speculated uh, that there could be some response because we knew that in adult mouse models that certain immune response genes in mice, which are called H2S, that these were associated with an altered immune response. And other anim uh, animals were not susceptible to low levels of heavy metal toxicants. And this was not true for mercury as well as for other types of agents. And we went ahead and we used the SJL mouse, which was known in adult mice, to, uh, to lead to the susceptibility. We tried to mimic the low-level exposures um, of the then vaccine schedule with respect to the mercury content uh, of uh, the, the childhood immunization schedule. And we found that there were big brains. Remember, we talked about big brains in a portion of kids with, with, with autism, and uh, we see alterations in the learning and memory centers, and you see here that there's increased number of cells a, as well. And this is a developmental landmark uh, and it's abnormal during this period, and similar to human autism, where the brains don't keep, exp you know, they don't, they don't get massively large, they level off, right, and they don't keep growing and growing and growing, they get larger at one period and then it plateaus. We have a very similar phenomenon, and we think that biochemically that there are some aspects of this that could be very important. We're looking at now at the, at the enlargement. The enlargement occurs in the same way that it's reported in human autism. The brains are wide. They're not tall. They're not long. There's brachycephaly. We see the same thing in the mice. And there are now some certain uh, gene expressions that are reported to be abnormal in human autism. Um, with P10 and semaphorin that are involved in this developmental pathway, and so we're exploring to see whether that could contribute and what we might learn. Um, we know that these animals have a wide range of abnormal behavior. Um, they also, besides the jumps, they also eat their poop. Um, and uh, in a normal situation, they should uh, be aggressive in, as a, in, this, in this type of scenario. And in the white here, the mercury-exposed mercury mice are much less aggressive, and uh, they come in and they start grooming themselves and, you know, and beating their tails in the corner in a very bizarre sort of way. Um, and their learning and memory is, is also uh, quite abnormal. 
um, we know that they have immune deposits in their brain, similar to the pandas animals, but the distribution is somewhat similar, and the target appears to be uh, it overlapping in part, uh, but not. Uh, there may be a wide, wider range of agents that are involved. We've also found, when we're talking about oxidative stress, that there are a variety of agents that, if we look in the brain, um, we see gene expression changing in something called thioredoxin. This is an oxidative stress marker involved in redox. Again, redox is this effect where changes in electrons. You may, might remember if any of you took chemistry back in high school. I always have to look it up again, you know, to, to remember which way it goes. But the point is, is that thyrodoxin is part of this family. And infections and toxic agents may singly and also in interaction alter key enzyme function through redox alterations. And so we think that this is a very important scenario. We have a significant effect in reduction in uh, BCL2 and also in thioredoxin. So um, in, I'm going to try to sum up very, very rapidly here um, to just talk about a wide range. Again, there's a huge amount of detailed ways in which immune cells have both immune effects, as you would expect, but also oxidative stress effects. Immune cells respond to infection, but they also respond to toxicant actions. So immune responses and oxidative stress responses occur in the immune cell. Oxidative stress can affect an immune cell, right? So you have a heavy metal causing oxidative stress, for instance, or other toxicant like a flame retardant, these PBDEs, that can alter immune cell function. And concurrently, you can also have infection leading to a scenario where reactive oxidative stress systems are activated and, and made abnormal. And there may be genetic ways in which this is uh, made worse for certain individuals. Um, we know that mercury exposure as one of many toxicants that may have an effect is an accumulator. Your body doesn't say, oh, I got my mercury from a vaccine, so since vaccines are meant to be healthy for you that, you know, that, that that's okay mercury. We accumulate all of these, uh, these agents, PBDEs, et cetera. It happens in the polar bears in the Arctic Circle as well as in, as in humans. And so we really need to think about that overall exposure and how this may alter our infectious uh, risk. Um, and we, we know that thimerosal is out there uh, in, in many places. And I take just a, a quick moment to talk to you about prospective birth studies uh, and how we can use those to try to do the detective work we need to do. This is a huge study. This was actually the Leprosy Museum um, uh, that, uh, in Bergen, which is where our data management occurs, the medical birth registry in our collaboration with, uh, with Norway. Um, and uh, it uh, was also quite a detective story to try to piece together what the cause of leprosy was, and the individual underwent a lot of uh, difficulties there. Um, the autism birth co cohort is 100,000 uh, women with uh, no, uh, uh, nothing other than being a Norwegian citizen. Uh, about 50% of the population participates, um, and we follow them from the 17th week of gestation and their fathers and the, and the children um, throughout life. And we're looking over this prospective uh, fashion with biological samples from the mother uh, and the father uh, during pregnancy as well as uh, uh, at, at birth and, uh, and then seeing the children now at three years of age to try to identify kids who have or at risk who appear to be at risk for autism. And we can use uh, various proteomic strategies and other strategies to seek biomarkers. So if we find evidence of infection in the mother, what would we see in the cord, umbilical cord blood of the baby? And how does that relate to who develops autism or other neuropsychiatric conditions at three years of age and later? So we use this in, in a variety of techniques like our green chip to try to identify a wide range of agents that may, that may be involved. Um, we can even find malaria, um, you know, uh, when, because these techniques don't presuppose that you're looking for agent X. It allows you to ask, is there any agent present of all those that are known to infect anybody with a spine, any, any organism with a spinal cord, with, a, with, with a, yeah, any vertebrate animal? 
um, and we use a variety of other multiplex techniques to try to uh, to try to look at the uh, the scenario. Um, and as in close, I urge you to think about the ways in which paradigms shift. Um, often there is resistance when a paradigm is just about to shift, and we used to think of duodenal ulcers as being uh, due to stress, uh, and occupational stress, until we found out about you know, the, the fact that there's Helicobacter pylori. Um, but that, that process of making the, you know, this, uh, this link is very, very complicated. So we have no simple ways to, 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 to tie together causation. Um, you know, there are many different frameworks and uh, is more, you know, more than I could really review for you, but there are various ways and tools that we can, that we can use to, to, to try to uh, isolate these, these effects. Um, and sometimes it takes a long time. This is another environmental agent. It's not infectious, but lead poisoning. And even in the first century BC, we had examples of neurotoxic effects um, reported. And uh, even Ben Franklin, you know, the opinion of the mischievous effect from lead is at least above 60 years old. And you will observe with concern how long a useful truth may be known and exist before it is generally received and practiced on. And so we, you know, we really uh, need to think very carefully about the ways in which we sort out the, uh, the signal from the noise. There's a lot of data out there. Um, we need to think very carefully and allow for the opportunity to jointly, collaboratively uh, determine what types of uh, factors are really at play in the production of autism. And uh, just to close on this quote, in the period that Einstein was active as a professor, one of his students came to him and said, the questions of this year's exam are the, last, uh, the same as last year. True, Einstein said, but this year all the answers are different. So thanks very much, and this is uh, many, many people to thank.